Science in human nutrition and functional medicine. And I also have a board certification in something called functional medicine. So we're going to talk about functional medicine a lot tonight. And why? Well, because it gets at the root cause of why actually people have a specific issue. Most of the time, and what I've actually experienced myself, is <clears throat> you go to one doctor after another doctor after another doctor, and they say, You've got XYZ symptoms, which means you have this diagnosis, or maybe we can't figure your diagnosis out. So we're gonna try a medication. If that doesn't work, we're gonna try another medication. And for me, and my graduate program, that's basically how I ended up going through seven different doctors over nine months until eventually I found a functional medicine doctor. And he said, hey, let's break this down to you more actually at the level of the cell. Look at your physiology, how these, actually, these systems interact with each other. And so you can actually start to think and link rather than name it, Blame it and tame it, which is kind of what happens on that side. So um, <clears throat> my eyes got open to the whole functional medicine world, and so then I dove into this, and um, and now I get to serve people with complex and chronic conditions, and so and I love it, and it's fun. So with that being said, when we actually go through school, because <clears throat> some people go, so I've got a thyroid issue, and you're going to adjust my thyroid, um, and I say no. Uh, we're actually going to look at something a little bit deeper, but just so you guys understand where I come from <clears throat> and where actually the, the hours chiropractic studies versus medical studies comes from. Basically, we studied the same thing, just a little bit different ratio of hours. So if you look at anatomy, roughly about the same. Chemistry, they're going to get more chemistry than we, than we do, than medical doctors versus chiropractors. Diagnosis, we get about double what they do. So again, someone comes in to see me for a low back problem. Is it a pinched nerve? Is it a... Um, herniation of a disc, is it a muscle spasm, is it um, a imbalance, is it a postural issue, so we have to differentially diagnose that. That's the same thing we want to talk about tonight. Why does someone have a specific issue, whether it be thyroid, whether it be in the gut, whether it be in the brain, whether you're experiencing it, where is it actually coming from? So we want to break all that down with you. So if you total everything up, roughly 3,000 versus 2,700 for MDs, Total hours, though, when you actually go into, they do pharmacology and you know clinical rotations, surgery, we're going to do nutrition, manipulation, all those kind of things, adjusting people. That comes out to 4485. So it's, you know, it's roughly equivalent as far as what we do, get with our, our, our medical degree. With that, though, the nice thing is that I've gotten to specialize in other areas like nutrition. I actually understand the root cause of why people have that. So fast forward now with where I'm at. And um, last year I got involved with this project. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of someone called Isabella Wentz. Okay, yep, so she's the thyroid pharmacist. And so she developed um, really a lot of different protocols. She wrote a book called Root Cause and now she's got Hashimoto's protocol out there. <clears throat> Fabulous people, they contacted me and they said, hey, do you wanna be in a, um, a documentary? And I was like, well, sure, that sounds like fun. So we had a couple clients come in the office, tape some footage for them. Um, and they take me just kind of talking about the thyroid and I was just part of, I think it was over um, 70 experts that were interviewed as part of that, that docu-series. So that was actually a lot of fun and um, I got to learn even more and we had even more thyroid clients coming into practice. So right now the number one thing that we're actually seeing in the office is people with thyroid disorders. And then really it's from there, a lot of digestive, a lot of other brain-based uh, conditions too, okay? so. The first thing though that typically people tell me is that they went into their doctor and they were feeling off, they were feeling brain fogged or they were gaining weight or they were bloated or they were constipated or their hair was falling out and just, there, was, there was symptoms, right? So you go to the doctor and they're gonna take a blood test 
And they say, well, then it sounds like you might have a thyroid problem. So, of course, we're going to check that marker, which is, what do you know what this is called? Thyroid stimulating hormone. You got it, right on, TSH. So they run a TSH on you, and they, it, you know, again, if you're lucky, and it's high, they're going to say you're hypothyroid. So they get out the pen pad, and they write you a prescription. And they say, okay, we're going to check in on you in three months, or maybe in six months, and we're going to repeat those labs. And if you're a good patient, you know, you're faithful, you take the, 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 the hormone, um, the levothyroxine, the synthroid, or whatever it is, WP Armor, right, all the different kinds of medications that are out there, tons of different ones, and you take it, and then all of a sudden they repeat your labs, and let's say if it was high before, maybe it's now within the normal range. But you probably still have symptoms. So that's what I've been told over and over and over again, is that, no, well, I still have symptoms, even though my lab test may actually be in the normal range. And that, for me, is pretty darn frustrating. And I think it's, for them, super frustrating as well, is that you have to go from doctor to doctor because they may tell you, hey, look, you're taking the medication, that's great, you no longer have a thyroid problem, you just need to deal with it. Hello, welcome. It's driving around my feet. There you go. You're going to have a seat, go ahead, uh, turn your phone off if you got a phone. I left and, it uh, Oh, perfect, good. And uh, enjoy, hope you learn a lot. So, like I was saying, um, you keep going back to doctor after doctor, just like I did, and you are being told, one, that again, it's not a thyroid problem, or it's you need this medication, or, you know, heck, it just might be in your head at that point, because that's what the fifth doctor told me that I saw, is that, you know, maybe I need a, a psychotropic medication. And I said, eh, no thank you, I'm gonna figure this out in a different way. So, then, what we've got to really then figure out is where did things break down in your physiology? Because if we were healthy at one point before, right, and then things started to break down, how did that process actually start to break down? So you have to start looking at your genetics, you need to start looking at your environment, and you need to start looking at your triggers. Because most of my clients will say, hey look, I was good until I had that pregnancy, until I got the divorce until I went into grad school. Um, I, I was healthy before that. Then I noticed my health started to kind of decline on me. So that's really important looking at actually where these triggering events are coming from. But more importantly, I think we actually need to look at our physiology because if you break the body down into different systems, you can see how one system actually starts to influence another system. As it regard, regarding thyroid, is actually influenced by almost every single endocrine system in your body. So an endocrine is really more of like a gland, meaning that it secretes a hormone. So any gland is gonna actually just make a hormone, that hormone is gonna travel into different areas of the body, and it's gonna create an action, and then that is gonna go back up and act on the gland that secreted it, and it's gonna kinda shut the thermostat off. That's essentially how the pituitary right up in here is making that TSH hormone. Because, for example, if your body needs more thyroid hormones, it's gonna make more TSH. That comes down, acts on the thyroid gland itself to make an enzyme called TPO, thyroid peroxidase. That's then gonna help us make something called T4. And we'll get into this, what all these kind of things mean, just in a little bit more detail. But these systems right here, again, not just the thyroid, but like the pituitary, which has a lot of different hormones besides TSH, and for example, the thymus, your immune system, huge impact on the thyroid, your adrenal glands, which actually create sensitivity to thyroid hormones at the cellular level, that's obviously a big impact, but it's not a discussion that you're gonna get with the medical doctor who's more interested in getting a medication to you and then out the door, we're gonna check you in three months and we'll see how you're I don't doing. Think regular doctors even check for your adrenals. No, they don't. And if they do it, they typically do it wrong because they'll measure it in the blood. And I don't mean that it's wrong. I mean that the level of dysfunction has to be so abnormal that they're not gonna pick up on a problem. And then the other thing, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the adrenals work on a circadian rhythm. So it's actually high at, in the morning and low at nighttime. So there's many different reasons why they may actually miss that issue. So we'll talk more about that because those adrenal glands are, are huge, they're stress handling glands. 
okay, well, who here doesn't have any stress? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So if you, if, if you don't have any stress, I'm going to call you and bring my four kids over, and then we're going to see what happens. Um, no. So, again, the point is, is that, I mean, if you look down here, again, huge ovaries and testes. I was just working with a man um, uh, yesterday, and I was reviewing his hormone labs, and I was like, hey, you know what? You've got more estrogen in your body than you have testosterone. That's why you have these symptoms. But it's also another reason why you trigger this thyroid problem in your body. So here's what we need to do. We need to actually get you to be more testosterone dominant. And here's how that works. And we're going to actually then be able to remeasure his labs and see the intervention that what we did made a difference. He's already starting to feel better for the interventions we've done on the dietary side and the supplementation side. But as soon as we do this for him, man, he is going to take off. And the same thing goes for women because it's either they're having hot flashes or their symptoms um, of sleep are not great or they're fatigued and their brain fog and those kind of issues are there too. So when we address those hormones, that feeds back up onto these master glands and it really starts to create a healthy loop. So again, just to, just, you know, I didn't cover heavily what the symptoms of um, hypothyroidism is, but let me just talk about that. So essentially, it's going to be bloating and or digestive issues, typically on the constipation side, okay? It's going to be, um, you're going to be brain fog, typically. There's going to be a, so slower mental processing because, again, those thyroid hormones are really important as far as your brain function goes. So our thermal regulation, so typically cold hands, cold feet, just cold in general. Um, and then very commonly hair loss, right? Skin, nails, right? All those kind of things are... are dictated by the regeneration and the actual ability to have normal thyroid hormones. And then also um, huge is, again, I find anxiety and depression are actually really, really common for that. And then also I think that the other phenomenon is walking by the salad bar and gaining five pounds. So when you're actually just looking at the salad bar, you're not even eating the salad. So typically inability to lose weight is very common as well because, again, the thyroid is, is your metabolism. It's the ability to actually get the machinery and the cells working specifically. Okay, so those are very common as far as on the low thyroid side. On the hyperthyroid side, okay, that's going to be more inward trembling and nervousness, heart palpitations, um, anxiety. That can actually also cause hair loss, uh, insomnia. So, but so you see that sometimes there's actually even a mix of these symptoms between hypo and hyper. So you can have symptoms from both hypo and hyper, and yet still actually have, you know, not only a thyroid disorder, but really um, an immune issue at the same time. We'll talk more about that. So um, for this, I think actually the best thing that we can do for you guys is help you guys go through and understand the thyroid and the actual physiology behind the thyroid so you can have a better understanding of what you need to do to get yourself healthier, okay? So let's actually just start from the top here. So we've got your hypothalamus, okay? Hypothalamus releases a hormone called TRH, okay? Thyrotropin releasing hormone. That is gonna act on the pituitary gland, okay? And the pituitary gland is gonna release something called TSH, okay? And then at the thyroid itself, you're going to make T4 and 90, roughly 97% of that is T4. And then you're going to make T3 and roughly, if you do the math, 3% of that is going to be T3. Inactive thyroid hormone, T4, active thyroid hormone, okay? Basically right here, T4, four molecules of iodine, T3, three molecules of iodine, right there. That's, that's where those numbers actually come from, okay? So, <clears throat> then what happens? Then we gotta get on a bus. So what happens is that actually when those hormones are made, there's a protein, so it's, it's called this triangle, the hormone, okay? There's gonna be a protein that actually binds onto that. You guys now have figured out, by the way, that I'm actually not a very strong artist. <laughs> so. I'll try to do my best. If something doesn't make sense, just ask me, okay? So, but what we have is we have a hormone that's bound by something called thyroglobulin. So we gotta get on what's called the thyroglobulin bus, okay? So you have a bunch of T4, 
bunch of T4, T3, T3, T4, okay? And then you have binding proteins to those, those, those hormones right there. Okay, put the wheels on it, all right? So then that's gonna go to, ah, another gland called your liver. And that's where T4 is converted into T3, okay? So that's where a conversion happens. So roughly about 60% gets converted into something called free T3. Okay, so it's active, we can actually use it at that point. 20% gets made into something called reverse T3, which is inactive unless it gets too high and it competitively binds with T3. So, are you guys measuring your reverse T3? Good, have you measured reverse T3? No, <laughs> that face is a no. So you need to measure that number because if it is too high, that could indicate that there may be stress that needs to be dealt with, or there could be infections that actually need to be dealt with as well. So diff different things can actually start to cause that reverse T3 to become too high. And if it is too high, that can actually competitively bind for T3, which can actually cause a state of hypothyroidism. Okay? Lastly, so we've got T3S or T3AC, okay, acetylase. And that 20% goes through the GIT, the gastrointestinal tract, and allows us to basically convert that into free thyroid hormones. So all of a sudden, oh, now we just started talking about the gut and how actually the gut is involved with converting thyroid hormones so you can actually get access to them, okay? So then, from there, since if we now actually have a free hormone, let's just you go. Need a bigger board. I know I do. <laughs> I, I honestly need a bigger office, and so that's that's in the works as well. Um, and then I can have a bigger board. <laughs> so then, at that point, we've got the cell, and in here we've got proteins and fats and carbohydrates. And you've also got a receptor, right? And there's different kinds of receptors out there. Right, square receptors and there's circular receptors, but the one we want is we want that thyroid hormone to bind onto that receptor. So for this, essentially, we've got this step right here, and then we've also got that ability to get into the cell. So we have to actually be able to bind here, and there's issues that can come up with this, including estrogen, can cause issues with binding on that. And then actually getting it into the cell is also dictated by healthy cortisol levels. So all of a sudden now we have a couple more mechanisms of why thyroid dysfunction can actually start to occur. Now, I goofed up, but basically this is step nine, that's step 10. But let's back it up here just a little bit more because I'm gonna erase there. Because there's actually 10 different metabolic steps that there really is that we have to talk about, okay? So there's one right here, okay? Two is right there, really TSH. And then actually at the thyroid itself, okay, we've got that T4, T3, okay? We're gonna have our third, fourth, and fifth. And so that's gonna be iodine, TPO, and we've got an amino acid, tyrosine, okay? So these right there are actually what's being measured by TSH, okay? But then we've got the bus, right? So the bus was six, okay? The liver that we talked about was seven, that conversion, okay? Eight was the gut, right? Nine, receptor, 10, inside the cell. So there's actually, again, 10 metabolic steps. But unfortunately, when you have a blood test of TSH, and that's the only marker you're looking at, you're only measuring those three. And I think that's a problem. In reality, you need to be measuring total T4 and T3, free T4 and free T3. 
TSH, reverse T3, T3 uptake. And then there's something called antibodies, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? Because they're all important, they all do different functions. If you don't look at all those functions, it's really easy to say, well, it's not a thyroid problem, or your thyroid problem is okay. And in reality, there may be other issues going on that you need to address. And that's really common in my practice. I find those issues all the time, okay? So another really common thing that happens is both dopamine and serotonin directly affect the hypothalamus. So if your neurotransmitters are out of balance, that can affect the, the hypothalamus. Where are your neurotransmitters made? Where's the majority, I should say that there are probably are some neurotransmitters made in your pituitary. Where are the majority of your neurotransmitters made? I'm going to throw out a wild guess in the gut. Right. <laughs> okay, in the gut. Right there, yeah. So, for example, serotonin, 90% of it's made in your gut. So it's huge, huge, right? And here's the thing, for 90% of the people out there with thyroid disease, they actually have they have that Hashimoto's and so in 1912 there was a doctor Dr. Hashimoto. Hashimoto that discovered that the actual cells of your immune system were attacking the thyroid gland itself okay so that's where the Hashimoto's comes from. So this is actually where you've got your, again, thyroid gland, okay, and then you've got... What is that Hashimoto's? We're going to talk about it right now, okay. Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease. It's essentially when you lose the ability to determine what is self and what is non-self. 99, 90 to 95% of people who have a thyroid disorder, okay, meaning of an elevated TSH, so when your labs go high and your diagnosis is hypothyroid, 90 to 95% of the time, you have Hashimoto's. That is, an, again, an autoimmune condition. It is the most common autoimmune condition in the United States. Unfortunately, most doctors don't care whether or not you're diagnosed with it because it does not change how they manage the medication. For you okay and I'm not here to bash medical doctors right I'm just I'm not gonna do it tonight but on the other hand it is very frustrating to people when you don't look at the immune system and how that process actually was triggered in the first place so what happens is you have triggers here okay could be gluten ah gluten that could be a huge trigger did you know that the most common diagnosis after Hashimoto's for an autoimmune disease is celiac disease? After celiac disease is diagnosed, the most common diagnosis of an autoimmune condition is Hashimoto's disease. So many of these conditions are on the same genetic loci. They're on the same area of where these genes actually hang out. So gluten is a huge trigger, right? And here's the thing, one exposure, can last up to six months. So a lot of people go, oh, it's just a fad, and I don't, I don't really think this is, is relates to me. Well, it probably does, <laughs> unfortunately. And it's kind of like a bad relationship. You gotta break up with it. And that's one of the things that I unfortunately had to do. Um, and it made a huge difference in my life, and it still continues to make a difference. Because every time I get exposed to it, I get brain fog, and I get fatigued, and my gut goes off, and it's just, and it's, it's a, it's a, disaster essentially so there's ways to test for that of course and we do food sensitivity testing in the office so I don't have to just say hey look trust me trust me that you're gonna actually get you know you're gonna feel better I'm willing to do food testing so that people really actually go okay well yeah I got a problem with that so now I can actually be a hundred percent and sometimes that's what it takes for people that really feel like this is gonna be a permanent correction because if that inflammation happens and it lasts, let's say, three months. But if you're eating it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, day in, day out, over and over and over again, 
it's just really hard to kind of crawl out of that cave and start to actually feel like a human being again. So that could be one trigger. Secondly, iodine. Wait a second, I thought iodine was on the other. It was. So iodine is one of the most important minerals necessary for the production of that enzyme, thyroid peroxidase, right? So there's T, P, O, and there's also thyroglobulin. These are the two antibodies, meaning thyroid peroxidase antibody, antithyroglobulin antibodies that are associated with Hashimoto's. We test those on our clients. We also repeat that test when we're working with our clients because I'd like to actually show people that their antibody levels are dropping rather than continuing to go up. And for a lot of, yeah? Is it necessary to, to test the uh, TGB along with the TPO each yes, time? Yes, because you, you may only be positive for your antithyroglobulin antibody. Now, I don't always test both antibodies every single time, but I just usually do it because it costs me about 15 bucks to do it. Um, and so I just want to make sure that I'm tracking those over time. Antibodies can fluctuate a little bit, um, but in general, if we're doing the right things with, with people, mm -hmm. diet, supplementation, lifestyle changes, we're getting at the root cause, those antibody levels actually tend to drop. Mm -hmm. For some of my clients, they'll actually be able to get those antibodies into remission, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that the, they no longer have the disease, but it does mean that the disease isn't active anymore, which usually also goes with people feeling a heck of a lot better. And that's always my goal in, in practice. Okay. Um, so iodine can actually make you increase more of that. Now there are people on one side that say iodine fixes everything, and there are people on the other side that say, look, you know, that's the worst thing in the world. Essentially, what you have to do is you have to make sure you're not going over 300 mcgs, micrograms of iodine. That's what the research says. After you go significantly over 300 mcgs, you will start making more of these antibodies if you're already making them, okay? But iodine is also a trigger. If you're doing high dose, so places where there's high iodine diets, there's high levels of Hashimoto's, okay? As far as so you're talking about the, uh, iodine that's in your food, not necessarily like the salt you're adding to your food. You're, d but either, doesn't, doesn't matter where it's coming from, but high, high levels of iodine are associated with the okay. incidence of Hashimoto's disease, okay? So again, 95% of people are suffering from this condition right here. What is another trigger? Well, how about insulin? So we have an epidemic in America right now where people are either pre-diabetic or diabetic. And what's happening is they have something called insulin resistance. So blood sugar and glucose have to kind of come together so you can get blood sugar into your cell, so that cell can then use that blood sugar to actually create energy, ATP. But as you become more resistant to insulin because your blood sugar levels may be starting to creep up, typically because of dietary choices, environmental toxicants, stress, then what happens is you start actually, you lose the communication at that cell and inflammation levels start to go up. So what happens? Again, that's going to affect that thyroid tissue. So that's a big one here. Also, the number one mechanism right now that we know of Alzheimer's and dementia is type 2 diabetes. So when people are starting to say, hey, look, I'm brain fog, I'm start stopping to, you know, I'm I, for forgetting people's names, I used to remember people's names, or I'm walking out of Target and I'm forgetting where my car is parked. That's, that's a big issue right there. I mean, that's something that has to be addressed. Sometimes that's addressing the metabolic issue. Sometimes it's actually supporting the brain as well. And there's just different things that we do here in the office, and we'll talk more about those. So the bottom line is that there's a lot of different triggers that you have that you have to actually address. Hormones are huge. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Stress is a big one, right? The gut is king, though. And we got to actually talk just a little bit more about that. So there was a doctor and his name is, well there was, there was, there is a doctor. His name is Alicio Fasano and he is um, at the University of Mar uh, Maryland, I believe, or you know, was it University of Massachusetts? I don't remember, one of those two, one of the M's. Um, he basically found how autoimmune diseases developed because he was studying celiac disease. 
And what he found was that in normal healthy tissue, you've got single cell walls going through your gastrointestinal tract, okay? These are all called enterocytes. And what happens is you've got shag carpet on top here, right? And then you've got a mucus layer that's kind of covering that whole shag carpet. And the shag carpet's there to just absorb and grab things and actually help us start to bring nutrients into the body. Well, with cortisol stress, you start to thin that layer down. So all of a sudden, all the little foods, well, little foods, big foods, and bacteria and viruses and parasites and everything else that we have in our gut start to actually make contact with that barrier. So all of a sudden we start getting an immune reaction. Then what's gonna happen is over time that creates inflammation and you start bringing your immune cells out there. So your immune cells go out there, they start trying to deal with the reaction that's happening, but over time you start to actually break your tissues down. So there's actually damage that occurs. So then what happens after that is you start creating channels in between these cells and things start coming through. So we become permeable. We become leaky, right? So there's a term, leaky gut, and you have to have leaky gut to have developed an autoimmune disease. This is the research that Alessio did. Um, and I got to hear him do a whole uh, two hour presentation on how actually he found the chemical called zonulin, which is the molecule that basically regulates these junctions or called tight junctions between the cells. So now, since everything's kind of coming through, you have kind of a war that starts to develop and these antibodies, right, start getting directed into this war. And then all of a sudden those antibodies go through the rest of your circulation and it just so happens that the thyroid tissue looks similar to what's going on in that tissue. So, and we start, follow, we start firing bullets at the thyroid tissue. So it's called malaria mimicry. And it's the same mechanism that happens for almost every single autoimmune condition out there. Rheumatoid, scleroderma, lupus, multiple sclerosis, all these different kinds of autoimmune conditions, the same mechanism happens, but there's different genetics, there's different triggers, and there's different environments. So again, from functional medicine, the idea is figure those things out figure out how to peel the layers of the onion so that you can actually deal with those triggers and then rehabilitate the immune system. That is the way that I have figured out how to help over 2,000 people with Hashimoto's, okay? Break that process down and that's how people can change their lives. That's what is really cool and that's what we do here at Redtail, okay? So, now that we've got that happening, it obviously can start to create a downward spiral. And the reason is I say that is because that 50% of people after they're diagnosed with one autoimmune condition already have another autoimmune condition. So what, that's why I repeat antibodies. So I just tell you guys tonight, if you're gonna work with someone, make sure it's someone who's repeating labs on you. Objectively, you wanna know that what you're doing is actually working. I wanna to prove to my clients that what we're doing in the office is actually working. But a medical doctor is not going to be willing to measure those antibody levels because they're not using nutrition. They're not looking at your diet. They're not looking at your lifestyle. They're not doing the right cortisol testing. They're only going to say, I only do the thyroid. I'm an endocrinologist, right? So that's the frustrating piece that we've got in front of us right now. But we can go around that. We can find ways to actually figure these things out so you can address those issues. So one of the most common things that I actually hear in my office as well is... that it was when I went through puberty. 
I developed Hashimoto's. When I had my second kid, I developed Hashimoto's. When I went through menopause, I developed Hashimoto's. So as estrogen levels go up and down, they can trigger your immune system as well. So what I like to do in my practice is I like to assess hormones comprehensively. So we run a, a, a urinalysis and it looks at three different estrogens. If you do blood work for estrogen, you're grouping all three of those estrogens together, okay? When you look at either urine or saliva, you're looking at free hormones, right? So there's, you just look at like, there's free T4 or there's T4, right? This is more metabolically active. <clears throat> so I wanna look at that. So we can do a urinalysis and it looks at four different measures of cortisol. It looks at all three estrogens, progesterone, testosterone, and melatonin, and then there's a, a, a detoxification marker in there as well. So that gives me a much better idea of what's going on with your estrogens. Because here's the thing, that estrogen right there, that is a growth hormone. So that can influence bacteria in your gut. That also causes more inflammation if it gets too high. So if women become estrogen dominant, they can make more insulin. If you make more insulin, you can start to convert that estrogen to testosterone. When you convert that hormone into testosterone, you make more insulin. So what happens is you can actually start to cause a vicious circle around and around and around because of one hormone abnormality. So you actually have to make sure what's going on with this piece right here. And even postmenopausal women can still be estrogen dominant because it's really related to the ratio of estrogen to progesterone. So I would like to look at that marker and see what's going on there. And again, one of the most common things I find is that people are they're giving me the international symbol of hot flashes. And that's usually an indication that there's, a, there's an estrogen problem. But it's more than just that. It's what actually was going on during their cycle as they went through their normal menstrual cycle. Even if you don't have one right now, you may still have problems because there was an issue previous to that, okay? So, because you actually still need estrogen in your body and you still want to actually be estrogen dominant, but you don't want to have an imbalance in these different hormones too much. It'll really, it really actually excites your immune system, okay? So, that's that. And then just to kind of recap what we were talking about before, you've got, again, a rhythm of cortisol. So in the AM, right, and then PM, you're gonna have really a rhythm here. So let's say at, if you get a blood test for cortisol and they check it at 11 AM, and it's spot on, right? It's right right there. But then in the morning, let's say it's high, and it comes down, and then it's low, and then it starts to spike back up again. So you may miss it, unfortunately. And so again, I love doing that hormone test because it'll actually look at those different hormones. Remember, cortisol is one of those things that actually can signal a lot of different processes in your body, including are you gonna have healthy bacteria in your gut? Are you gonna have a healthy barrier in your gut? Cortisol impacts another area in your brain called your hippocampus. So what does the hippocampus do? Regulates temperature and the... That's the hypothalamus. The only, oh, we're almost there. Yes, memory. Oh, it's yeah, memory? Mm-hmm, yep. So short to long-term memory, very importantly, is, is gonna be at the hippocampus. So it's in your temporal lobe, so the, the anterior horn of your temporal lobe. And <clears throat> that's huge again, because again, as we age, I think people just, you know, we go to our doctors and say, well, I'm having a problem, you know, remembering things. Oh, everyone does at your age. Well, yeah. <laughs> that might be average, but it's not normal. You know what I mean? Cortisol in, also impacts your sleep. So what do all my clients say? My sleep's awful, you know, I wake up and I'm still tired, or I, I you know, I, I get up and I have headaches and as the day goes on, that gets better. Those are all cortisol symptoms for me. Right? So I have to know what's going on here. And then as we do interventions, we come back, repeat the test, verify that it's gotten better. That's just good medicine, I think, okay? So that's that piece as well. So here's the thing. If we keep doing the same things that we've been doing and we expect different outcomes, that is the definition of <laughs> Insanity. 
right? <laughs> you keep doing the same things over and over and over again, thinking that we're getting a different outcome. And it's insane. It really is truly insane. So again, I, I, like I said in the beginning of this, if we were healthy at one point in our life, and then something happened, we have to look at how that physiology actually broke down. And that's, I think, where actually the functional medicine comes in and functional neurology. Because if you can actually look and support at what's happening in the body, what's happening in the brain, you put those two things together, I see pretty amazing things happen on a regular basis. And that should be the case for everyone out there. We are all basically the, the same genetic material coming out. We all have some advantages and disadvantages, but it is our experiences plus that genetics, plus those triggers we had in our life that is going to create these issues. So for me, taking more medications, I don't know if that's actually the, the best scenario. Now again, I don't put people on medications, I don't take people off of medications. What we do here in the office is we actually want to break the physiology down so you can start to understand why you have the problem. If you don't do that, <clears throat> you're not gonna understand, well why would I take a supplement, or why would I do a dietary change, or why would I need to do that lab? It, all these things can make sense if you actually understand the background behind them. But if you don't have someone taking the time with you to explain that, it gets really confusing. And then it's unfortunate because people suffer because of that. Right now, there's, um, I believe, upwards of 40 million Americans who actually have thyroid disease. It's one in eight women who actually have thyroid disease. And that number is going up and up and up. Number two prescribed medication in the world is yeah, or levothyroxine, T4, right? So that's pretty frustrating. You know, again, we, we represent 5% of the world's population and we're consuming 70% of the world's medications. It's insane, insane. And right now in the 37 industrialized nations, we're 36 and we spend twice what the number two most expensive and, and you know, consuming per dollar um, a healthcare system is as well, which is the United Kingdom. We're spending twice what they spend. We're the number one and ranked 36. So we gotta do something different, right? If you want a different solution, do something different. That's all you guys learned from tonight. <laughs> it was worth, I think, coming here. But I think when you start to break things down, it'll make more sense. Now, last thing I wanna talk about with you guys too, a little bit more, is just blood chemistry, lab values, okay? How we actually get those lab values, how they work. Well, so for example, in the Denver metro area, <clears throat> any lab, let's just look at TSH, okay? Thyroid stimulating hormone. They look at a big population of people, right? So people who have cancer, people who are eating the standard American diet, people who have thyroid disease, um, people who, let's say you have diabetes, any, anyone, everyone is basically collected into that, that group. And then they say that a normal range is 0.4 to 4.6. And that's basically after they've cut off two endpoints on the low side and the high side. They call them standard deviations, okay? So you've got that range. But the American Endocrine Society says your range should be between one and 2.5. And what most of my clients say is that, hey, when it's closer to that one, I feel the best. That's when I actually feel really good, is when I'm closer to that number. So if you're at 0.7, right? If you're at 0.7, or if you're at 4.2, is there a problem? I'm still in the normal range. You're still in the normal range. So again, either you're told, oh, there's not a problem, it's not a thyroid issue, mm -hmm. or you're told, oh, well, we'll watch it. We'll come back in a year and we'll see if we give you the jersey. So again, that's, that's crazy. I think that for me, I would much rather use a functional range. So in our practice, we use functional blood chemistry ranges. So I wanna compare your numbers off of a healthy population because we can actually change things a lot more efficiently if we're looking at your numbers versus at a functional blood chemistry range. Same thing goes for blood sugar. Anything over 99, right, is pre-diabetes. I'd rather see your blood sugar numbers be in the 80s. Hemoglobin A1C, anything over a 5.7 is abnormal, okay? Except that there's research that says you preserve the most neurons 
an A1C of 5.2 or less. So I want to keep my neurons. I want to have the best blood sugar possible, right? I want to be the healthiest. I want to be around so I can actually, you know, enjoy my grandkids rather than just drool over them. Like that, that doesn't make any sense to me. That, that's crazy, right? And that's what happens is people get so sick, we have to put them in a home. Have you been promised grandkids? That's right. You've been promised. I'm not being promised anything. Uh, you've been promised grandkids. That's right. So in our office, we, we run, I think it's around 70 markers. And uh, we do that through a co-op because we get a very discounted rate on those labs. Because I don't like to go through other medical doctors for my labs. They second guess me. They don't want to get the full panel. They do everything they can to basically sabotage what my clients actually need. But when I get that information, I can more comprehensively evaluate where someone's at. And then typically I do two to three repeats over about four months or so as I'm working with someone. Maybe be up to six months, but on average I'm working with people around four months. And then I'm repeating the markers that are normal, right? If we do something different and we repeat that marker, are we actually getting an objective change to it? And I think that should happen. Now, in my practice, again, like I said, I don't manage medications, but sometimes people improve enough that they can reduce their dependency on some medications. Some of my clients have gotten off those medications. If people don't have doctors, I say, hey, look, go see this person. They'll help you with that piece. They'll be willing to work with you on that piece. Sometimes the certain medications that people are on are not working for them. So I say, look, this practitioner may be more willing to work with you on that medication piece as well. So sometimes it takes a team, guys, to really actually address these issues too. And that's just, I mean, again, I've worked with enough people, I can kind of figure it out. Hey, look, I can do this for you, but I can't do this piece for you. So here's the person you want to see as far as that goes. And I think people appreciate that when you can do that too. Okay? So on that... You have to start asking yourself, why? Why do you want to get better? Why do you want to improve? Is it a quality of life issue? Is it that you're not feeling your best? Is it the, the, the fact that you can't enjoy your relationships? I mean, how much have these issues really cost you? We look at it's not just financials, it's like, how about just enjoying life? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but unless you're a Buddhist, you may not be coming back. So, I mean, for me, I want to live to the highest potential. I want to be optimal. I don't want to just survive and go through life and struggle at the same time. Because that's, that's what was happening to me in my grad school program. I was struggling big time. And I started to fail classes and I started to tank. So I knew that there was a big problem and I just had to find the right person to help me through that transition process. That's really all this is. This is another transition process of your body. So you have to figure out what you gotta do. Do we need to eliminate certain things? Do we need to identify those triggers? Is there an infection going on in the gut? Is there something going on as far as you know um, a hormonal issue? Is it a cortisol problem? All these different areas you have to investigate and, and start asking that question, well, why did this occur? And if your why is big enough, the The how does it matter? It really doesn't. Because the how, we'll figure that out. The why is more important, right? What your contribution is to, to this planet, right? Why you actually want to be here. The how is just, okay, we need these labs, we need to be able to work on these exercises, we need to be able to take these supplements, this is the right diet for you. All those things, we can figure those things out because we've done it for other people before as well, okay? But it's all about the why. So, what I want to do is I want to basically go through what our process that we have here in the office is, and then I want to actually answer any questions that you guys have. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if someone like calls, okay, and they make a, a phone call, and they, they say, hey, look, I want to set up an initial consultation. You say, okay, great. We've got some qualifying questions for you, okay? We want to make sure that you're actually a good fit in the practice. So, we ask you, what's your motivation level, okay? If you are over an eight, we will accept you for that initial consultation. If you are a seven or less, we tell you very politely, you know what, this may not be the right time for you to actually make a change because you may not have your health as your top priority. You, it, to be able to make changes, right, you have to have that motivation. Now, we can help you because sometimes tired people struggle with motivation issues, but you have to at least have the willingness to change, okay? 
That's one right there. Two is you do have to be, you have to be willing to be able to change your diet. Okay, that plus you must be willing to take supplements. And most people are like, oh god, I already take a lot of supplements. Here, check my bag. <laughs> Like, okay, maybe we need to figure out what the, the right supplement combination is for you. Because <laughs> that, I mean, they're expensive, right? They're, they're super expensive. You've got to figure out which ones are really working for you and which ones are just crap and get them out. Or they may just not be right for you right now. And, and that's important too, right? So that's a critical piece. Three, right? We have to be willing to show up for office visits. Now in my practice, again, when I'm working with chronic people, I may see them every other week. And as far as for me, that's pretty typical. But we have therapies in the office, and sometimes if we need to use those therapies, they can be up to twice a week. So I just don't know until we do an evaluation on someone what we actually need to use for them, okay? But that's something that's really important. We make sure that we actually give someone the right care at the right frequency level, okay? So then four, right here, is paperwork, right? So we've got about 24 pages of paperwork and no joke, it'll take a couple hours to do it. But I wanna be thorough with people. I wanna actually read through that and make sure that I'm on my A game with someone when they come in this practice because I wanna give them the best experience, I wanna give them the most thorough examination, I wanna give them the best recommendations that I have at my report of findings, okay? So that's huge. You have to be willing to get the paperwork in, and we need it in at least 48 hours in advance. If it's not in, we politely call you and say we're gonna have to reschedule you. If that happens again, we politely take your money <laughs> and say, please call us back, maybe six months to a year if you're serious at that point, if you wanna move forward. But we're just too serious. We wanna be able to work with clients who are ready to go, okay? So five, here is that probably the most common question I get is insurance. Does my insurance cover that? I have no idea. I really truly don't. And every insurance policy is different, okay? And there's Medicare, and there's Kaiser, and there's Aetna, and there's Blue Cross Blue Shield, and there's so many different insurance carriers we don't know. But what I can tell you is that at your comprehensive consultation, I will actually try to get my office manager to do an insurance verification and she'll try to figure out, do you have any coverage for what we do in the office? But here's the thing, I'm not, I'm gonna be upfront with you guys, there's always out of pocket expense, right? I mean, supplements cost money. Insurance may not be willing to cover everything we do. Medicare or Med I Don't Care <laughs> doesn't cover what we do in this practice. Right. They don't cover the labs that we want. They don't cover the, the office visits. It's, 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 and the, and then the, um, the, the secondary insurance covers less, I think. And they go by the same you know, guidelines as, as Medicare. So if your care needs to be dictated by insurance, we're just not going to be a good fit because the recommendations are going to be made for you, uh, unfortunately, out of pocket. Okay? Um, Six, right here, is again, clothing. So I wanna make sure that you guys are aware that we do a full neurologic comprehensive exam, which means I need access to your arms, I need access to your legs. I'm gonna basically do about a 68 point neurologic exam. And if I have you guys in tight tights or like jeans, then <laughs> it's not gonna work very well for your exam, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're, you're actually ready to go when you come in for the exam. Right? So that's pretty important too. And then seven, right here. Like I said, up here, health has to be your top priority. So number one, if you're taking care of your grandma, I mean, fantastic. But you're probably not gonna want to make the changes. You're probably gonna be able to make the office visits. If you are taking care of a sick spouse, that's going to be really challenging, I think, to, to be able to actually do the care necessary to get well, all right? And then eight, is the spouse. Ah, the spouse. So in my practice, I require the spouse for your initial consultation. 
And the reason is, is there's no way, no how that you're going to take all the information that I just gave you and explain it to them without it becoming the telephone game. Because what I do is I break down someone's entire care plan to them with my initial consultation. And I say, here's exactly what we need. Here's what we got to do. Here's what the insurance covers. Here's what the cost is. Everything is basically covered during that. Plus, they actually get to see someone have a physical exam and what I do. So they can actually start to go, oh, wow, maybe there is a problem here. So rather than it being actually a problem when someone goes home and says, hey, I want to do this program, they're like, what do you mean? You're going to go see a chiropractor and he's going to adjust your neck and that's going to fix your thyroid? I just found it's a lot easier when I can have that person in my office and I can give people my recommendations at the same time. Then they can actually ask those questions to me and they can be on the same page so we don't elevate your cortisol levels more when they don't understand why I'm making these recommendations. Lastly, Karen, you don't have to go get married. Okay. <laughs> I know. Not... <laughs> don't have a spouse. Okay, good. Because I've literally had that question before. <laughs> I don't have a spouse. Do I have to cook? And I'm like, no, please. Way too much stress, right? So those are the main requirements that I have in my practice as far as what I need to have done in, for people to be ready to kind of go in, in, the, in the, the office, okay? Um, I think it's reasonable. I think it sets people up for success. And because I've worked with a couple thousand people with, with chronic conditions, I don't want to make recommendations for someone who's not ready to make those. I want to make sure someone is ready to come in and, and, and get that work done. Again, it's all individualized for people. We use supplementation. We use therapies. We do lifestyle and dietary changes. I have a full-time um, uh, nutritionist, Rania. She's amazing. And she can support people to help them make those dietary changes. But no matter what, we just don't know exactly what's going on until I actually examine you. So I get this question all the time. Well, how much, how much is my care plan going to cost me? I'm like, I don't know. Do you drive your car into the auto mechanic when the check engine light is on and you ask them how much is it going to cost? I, I mean, I think that's ridiculous. They, they're going to have to do a diagnostic. The exact same thing that we do in the office. I want to know what's going on so I can fill your problems out so I can give you a better idea of what that cost is. Okay? And then from there, we just start to move forward if that's something that you feel comfortable with. Now, that I got through that, what questions do you guys have? Is this your only location? Yes, ma'am. Sure is. I think I already have two. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, it can be twice a week, but if that's going to stress you out coming into the office, we're not going to want to be a good fit together. On the other hand, if you can make it here every other week, or if it's appropriate and we can do phone consultations, I'll do that as well. I do work remotely with people, but I like to have them come in and get the exam done make my recommendations, make sure they feel comfortable with that, and I'll say, hey, look, at least once a month, I'd like you to be here, oh, yeah. okay? Other than that, I can work with that. I just had... Um, uh, but twice a week was scary. <laughs> it's, and look, we do brain-based therapies, and we sometimes do other things. For example, thyroid-specific, we'll do something called cold laser therapy, and that is really for the thyroid itself. But you know what? I don't do that with everyone, and I didn't used to do it, and I still got results. I just get better results now that I've actually incorporated that therapy in the practice. But the thing is, if it's going to stress it just you... Depends. Right, it depends. It totally depends on the person. If it's going to stress someone out, I say, you know what, let's not do that. Let's just do all the other work that we can. And if we really need to, maybe we can wrap our head around you know, getting you to commit to that level. Because I get it. There's commute down here. There's commute back. There's traffic. There's all that stuff. It's, and that can be a nightmare. Okay? Okay. What are your hours? For so um, it depends on the day. So we're 9 to 6. Uh, excuse me, 9 to 5 on Monday, uh, 8 to 4 on Tuesday, again, 9 to 5 on Wednesday, and then we're 10 to 5 on Thursday. Mm -hmm. So we have a little bit of flexibility as far as that goes. We may eventually bring in Friday hours, but right now I'm the only doctor that's working with um, the metabolic cases. Is there nothing on Fridays right now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Nothing on Fridays right now. Mm -hmm. Again, with where we're at, there's a, a brain-based therapy that we do. Um, called neurofeedback, <clears throat> and we're getting really busy with it. So when we move into our larger office, which is going to be more central Boulder, um, we may bring in more therapies and have people doing those on Friday. And uh, we may have another uh, doctor at that point too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, so, <clears throat> how much uh, of Dr. Wentz's um, protocols protocols do you do? It just really depends on the person. Um, I I mean, like for example, I'm not going to use low dose naltrexone. 
can't describe it, right? That, that can be part of the protocol. But anything from anti-inflammatory diets to um, you know supplementation to even she's advocating cold laser at this point. Um, there's diff different things that I work into people's plan, and it just really again just depends on what the person needs. Um, but any of the, I mean, she may not do the exact um, some of the specialty labs like the different distributors of those labs, but the ones that I use are the ones that I'm comfortable with and the ones that work really well. Now you said earlier that you you do you do your labs here? I don't do my blood draws here, so we send them out to LabCorp. Okay. We use a professional co-op service, so basically that, that is, it's a way for us to get a discount on the on the prices of the labs. So right. we give you a requisition if we decide to move forward with care, uh -huh. and then typically your first office visit with me in, in the office is going over your blood work. Uh -huh. And then usually I'm gonna see you in a couple weeks after that, and we may be going over a stool test, or we may be going over a food sensitivity test, or mm -hmm. when you start, those you other labs start to filter. You, you said you do food sensitivity here? No, again, we give you a test kit. Test you kit. would go to like Boulder Community Health or you'd go to another center. Oh. So it, is there get... one specific one that you use? Mm -hmm. Cyrex is oh. the company that we use. Okay. Yep. So it just depends on the person, the situation, you know, mm -hmm. what we're actually trying to look for. Sometimes I don't do food sensitivity testing on people. It really kind of just depends on, on what we're actually trying to, to go after. Mm -hmm. So what, what about someone who has Hashimoto's and has gone through everything mm -hmm. and still isn't feeling better? So I need to, I need to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. At that point, I mean the thing is, I mean, is that I've changed diet, I mm -hmm. use supplements, I you know I take low dose naltrexone, I take cortisol calm, I take you know yes. personalized vitamins, right? And I still don't feel optimal. So again, that that makes me think that part of what's going on with you. Well, I think there could really be a couple different things. I think that infections are very commonly misdiagnosed and they're just not diagnosed at all. And they may have been something that's been missed with you. I mean, there's six common, actually, infections that can kind of trigger Hashimoto's, but... Well, yeah, I, I, I had a mono. Right. That's what triggered it. Okay, right. So you had Epstein-Barr. Mm -hmm. Right. And then two, though, is actually related to something called these T-Reg cells. So if... <clears throat> Your T-Rex cells are still out of balance, even though these are actually the cells that regulate the antibody-producing cells. Mm -hmm. If those haven't been brought back into optimal health as well, mm -hmm. then you're going to still continue to make more antibodies. So even though if you remove the trigger, you still have to rehabilitate the immune system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one of the things we do. Again, it's supplementation. There are therapies that we do in the office that actually help with that too. Mm -hmm. uh, something called PMF that we do in the practice, like pulse electromagnetic frequency therapy. Mm -hmm. We can actually help with that. So I don't know exactly at this point, but I think again, my job would be to say, hey, look, here's the areas that I think are the weak link with you. Mm -hmm. Here's the information we need on that. Here's a plan that I would do with you. And then mm -hmm. do you feel comfortable with that? And if you did, I would say, okay, great. Let's, let's execute that. Let's mm -hmm. do that. I think most of my clients feel better within 30 to 45 days. So, I mean, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Reasonable. And if they're not, then I have to say, okay, well, why not? And then we start to go, they're not taking the supplements, you're not doing the diet, am I wrong, did I miss something? Mm -hmm. So then you gotta figure out what, what's going on at that point. And then again, we always, I come back and I repeat those labs because I do wanna find that objectively we're making an improvement. And that's for every single person in practice, okay? And isn't mono something you would like never get rid of? Well, any virus that you catch, you can't get rid of it because your body's basically established an immune response to it. You may still have virus in your body for it, but for some people, they it, continue it to, yeah, they, it can reactivate, and that's one of those infections right there. My son got it, and uh -huh. it's been active a couple of times in his life. Yeah, and it can really throw people for a loop, and it can be a very common trigger, especially as it relates to Hashimoto's. So doing the right protocols for that, for bringing the actual viral load down, plus then re-regulating the immune system is one thing I'd be thinking as, as far as what we need to do. Um, there's probably some other protocols that I would think about with you as well. Just kind of, it would just be assessing where you've, what you've done and, and what you have. So if done. I've used LabCorp in the past for mm -hmm. all my lab tests, would yep. they, and you're, you're saying you, that, can you use the same tests or not? Or I can, but I don't consider them valid unless they've been done within a couple months. Uh huh. So they're just not, they're just not fresh tests in front of me unless okay. they've been done, with, you know, I would say by end of September is one of the last thing. If they haven't, then I say, okay, here's the blood work that we need. Mm -hmm. um, and we again, we just give people our discounted price on that as far as those labs go. Um, insurance can't. 
Insurance. If you have out-of-network testing benefits, but 95% of people don't. So I don't go through insurance because I, I'm not um, going to be, I'm not under assignment for someone's insurance plan, which means I'm only allowed to test specific markers. And for people, I want to actually get all of their information. So we usually do combination panels, which give us a lot of the information we need, but we can, we get a, we can offer it at a discounted price. I see. So it's still some out-of-pocket expense as far as that goes, but in the reality is, you know, I've seen people spend way less on that than through their insurance. Okay. So it's just kind of it's like a convenience uh, factor that's there. Okay. It's the same exact labs, the same technology. It's just done through someone paying for it in advance. The doctor okay. I go to is actually a DO, not an MD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. It's the exact same thing. Difference. No, not really. Not unless they go to schools that learn how to adjust, and there's only like one of those in America. So they're pretty much just medical doctors. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's great. But if it doesn't work for you, you gotta start doing something different as well, right? So again, that, um, was there other questions that you guys had? Yeah, Aaron? quick question. So I think you, um, and I, so tonight I know it's focused on the thyroid, mm -hmm. but you do kind of, do you cover kind of everything? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so like we know anemia. And yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, I consistent diagnosing anemia in my office, and there's many different kinds of anemia. Okay, so you have to know how to deal with that. Also, why someone's anemic, right? That's mm -hmm. a big deal because it's typically gastrointestinal, not from your menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. So you gotta know the differential diagnosis for those kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, so we can do that. And I don't think I, I don't do everything in the practice, but mm -hmm. majority of chronic and complex conditions is what I've, my training is in. So I feel comfortable with that. Okay? Like one more. Yes, please. <laughs> please. What about, um, I've also been diagnosed with gastroparesis and uh -huh. microcephalus. Okay. So again, what's happening is you're getting a systemic breakdown of your gastrointestinal tract. So we have to figure out how to actually reintegrate so I have that. a terrible diet already. I cannot uh -huh. do anything. I know. So part of that is actually looking at your central nervous system because that's one of the reasons why you have the gastroparesis. And so if no one's looking at that piece for you, no. that's gonna be a huge issue. I mean, 60% you, of your motility, 60 to 80% of your motility comes from your vagus nerve in your brainstem. Mm -hmm. If you're not looking at that piece, oh, nice. then it's gonna slow things down and cause gastroparesis, which just means that your gut's not moving fast enough. That's it. Everything sits there. For it's just, it's, it just sits there and it rots and it causes all sorts of symptoms, Sucks. right? It sucks. But so again, take a step back and figure out well, why would that be? And for me, I would definitely want to have a look at your central nervous system and figure out how can we actually help you rehabilitate that. Or are there other triggers that you're not aware of that could be causing enough inflammation that's slowing your GI tract down, okay? Or causing a thyroid issue, then making you to actually have the gastroparesis in the first place. Again, you, you can call it gastroparesis, and that's great, but there's 10 different reasons of how that can happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you just gotta, you're gonna check those boxes off and figure those things out. I'm a mess. <laughs> it's okay, we deal with, yeah. we deal with hot messes. It's, it's all right, okay? Um, I feel comfortable as far as you know, working on that too. I work with a bunch of people with gastroparesis. It, just, it doesn't scare me anymore because it's like, well look, just figure out why someone has that. And if I can't, I'll tell you. Say, I, I don't know. I don't know how to help you. I'm not afraid to say that. It's okay. I've had to say that to people. Why not? Just send them to someone who can. Or I'll try to help you to find someone who can help you, right? I mean, I'll just, man, I'm just blatantly honest. I'm sorry. But if life is too short just yeah. to waste time and money on something that's not going to work. Right. Okay? Yeah. All right. So anyways, guys, normally that exam is 475. Okay? We're doing that for 175. So if you guys want to take advantage of that and you think that you're ready to kind of at least commit to the initial exam so I can give you my best recommendations when I sit down with you, um, then I think that's a great deal. So if you guys want, this lovely lady right here can help you with that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Karen, are you helping with that too? Okay, Dr. Karen's helping with that too. This is my wife, by the way, guys. Oh, she's the lucky one. That's right. That's I'm the lucky right. one. She is the lucky one. That's, that's, I'm the lucky one, really. Um, okay, um, if you guys want, if you have any other questions, just come up and ask me. I'm happy to take those questions too. Okay? So thank you so much. Thank you.